if you're struggling with sexual sin and you keep quiet about it, which is the normal thing, that's what everybody seems to do, uh, then it's free to grow. It's like a, a mushroom. You keep it dark in a dark place, it's going to grow. Mm -hmm. You expose it to sunlight, then it you have a chance of killing it. Mm -hmm. But it's going to grow if you keep it in the dark. And just that simple. You allow it to grow mm -hmm. because nobody else knows. Welcome to another episode of What to Say and How to Say It, the podcast to help you fix your marriage. My name is Shai Lewis. Our mission is to help you Christian married man or woman navigate conflict and build connection so you can have a thriving marriage. Today we have another special guest, Judge Kent, better known as Buck Levis, who has graciously volunteered to tell us his story. Now, uh, Judge Kent Buck Levis is the author of Coming Clean, a look at his own struggle to break free from the grip of sexual sin. Without going into details, Levis explains the progressive nature of sexual sin and how it acts like a cancer in one's life, marriage, and work. Judge Levis earned his BA degree from Fresno State, his JD from the University of San Diego School of Law. He came to faith in Christ in 1977. He's retired now, and uh, he was a superior court judge from Fresno County in 2008 and now lives in Cambria, California. Welcome, Judge Levis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for letting me be here. <laughs> So one interesting fact is that nearly two thirds of Christian pastors and youth leaders have struggled with pornography in a world where there's sexual images everywhere and behavior that's deemed permissible. It's no wonder addiction is rampant and wreaking havoc in our homes, in our lives. Now, I think as Christians, we're often surprised to hear when this is a struggle for our clergy and we just forget that they are mere mortal men and women just like us, which is why this book is very important. So today we want our listeners to walk away with the what to say if you're in a relationship with someone who you know might be struggling in this area. Now, before we get to that, I want to make sure our listeners know that we have a website, greaterimpact.org where we have a free PDF that you can download in your free time to go over some of these hard conversations where you might encounter difficulties like this. So check us out in your free time. All right, so if you don't do this well, you can create an environment that harms the healing process potentially in others instead of helping them reach their true freedom in Christ. Now, Buck, you say you struggled with secret sexual sin from an early age. How did this begin? I think it began the same way that most kids begin. Um, the, but from an early age, I hid, I hid my sexual sin. I, it was, I felt, I believed that my parents, uh, those that knew me, that loved me, if they knew about it, wouldn't love me anymore. And so I kept it a secret. And starting as far back as I can remember, just as a young kid, uh, starting, you know, with uh, sexual acting out as a child, I would never share that with anyone. Mm -hmm. um, except my, my buddies, my friends, uh, who were also involved in the same kind of sexual sin. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you're right. It is something that's very common and it starts earlier than we really think. And I think now with social media, our kids are exposed to even more of it. Uh, so that, that is interesting that your friends were involved as well. Now, 
In terms of adulthood, you see most men uh, want to live their lives in just quiet anonymity. Why, why is it such a bad idea for men? Because like you said, it's usually kept secret. So I can imagine that only becomes more of a secret as uh, men become young men. If you're struggling with sexual sin and you keep quiet about it, which is the normal thing, that's what everybody seems to do, uh, then it's free to grow. It's like a, a mushroom. You keep it dark in a dark place, it's going to grow. Mm -hmm. You expose it to sunlight, then it, you have a chance of killing it. Mm -hmm. But it's going to grow if you keep it in the dark. And just that simple. You allow it to grow mm -hmm. because nobody else knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such an honest response. So, okay, we have an audience of mostly Christian married men and women. Did your sexual sin or your struggles in the dark impact your marriage? And I would imagine even your work as a, as a superior court judge. How did it show up there? I don't think it affected my work as a judge, although I may be just being in denial about it, I don't think I am, but what men tend to do, and women also, who are struggling with sexual sin, is that they, what I did was I compartmentalized. Mm. That was a part of my life. It was a secret. Nobody knew about it. And it, I just isolated that part of my life uh, from everything else that I did. I think that it probably did impact my marriage more than I knew. I think I was in denial about that. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, a, a sexual sin is going to impact a marriage. Uh, it has to. Mm -hmm. um, even though I compartmentalized, and even though my wife, for many years, did not know that I struggled with sexual sin, mm. um, or at least I didn't think she knew. Um, I do believe that it affected our intimacy. I think it affected our relationship. And my wife and I had a wonderful relationship. We were married. When she passed away, we had been, had, had celebrated our 49th wedding anniversary about two months before she passed away. Mm. And we, we loved each other deeply. But yet there was this that pulled away from, pulled me away from everything my marriage could have been. Wow. And I think that is true about any sin. We, we don't know how it, it can affect other people. We think we are, we are the only ones that are affected by it. And, you know, the word says it just will grow and it grows and it grows and it'll you know, take you down a road that you're not really prepared for. So I, I appreciate your honesty in that. And I, and I know our listeners can probably relate to that. Now, I'm curious around your wife's role in your recovery, because in your book, you say that you cannot overcome a sin by yourself. Uh, what was her role in your recovery? You know, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I'm not a counselor, a therapist. So I don't know if it would work for everybody. But for me and for my marriage, I think my wife did exactly what was required. And when she discovered, when I finally sat down and confessed to her uh, what was going on, mm -hmm. um, I think she did exactly the right thing. And what she said is, I love you. I will support you. I will be there for you. I will do whatever I need to do to help you. But this is your problem. You mm. deal with it. I'm not going to solve your problem for you. Which I think is just exactly the right response. At least it was for me. 
Why do you say that? Because it forced me to take responsibility for my own actions. Mm. Uh, I couldn't at that point look to somebody else to help me solve my problem, to, um, to be part of something that I created or the enemy created or whoever created, it was created by me, mm -hmm. not by her. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that was going to have to solve it. Uh, God and myself, we're going to solve this. She could help. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do it for me. And that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so key because when you're married, oftentimes it's so easy to want to fix your spouse if you see them struggling in an area and take take it on as your problem. And so many so many couples that we talk to even take it on in such a health unhealthy way as if um, it, it has something to do with them. And so I think that your wife was very, very wise in knowing that it had nothing to do with her and that it was your issue to solve with the Lord. So the other side of that coin is this, mm -hmm. is that for the person who's caught in this sin and confesses that sin to their wife, their spouse, um, they're terribly afraid. I was mm. I'm scared to death that my wife was going to condemn me. Mm. My wife was going to hate me, that mm. the, our marriage was over, that our love was over. I was scared to death. And I needed the reassurance from my wife that she was going to stand by me. And she did. And she reassured me of that which gave me the confidence to go ahead with my healing. Wow. And I, and I, I think that's also worth saying as well. I think I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because safety, creating a safe environment, a grace filled environment, isn't something that when we're hurt by the sin and we're impacted by the sin is our first thought. And so I, I agree, it's important to note that having um, someone um, create that safety for you and who is willing to walk with you, uh, not judge you, not condemn you, because this is like any other sin, it's, it falls short of God's standard, um, is, is very key in the healing process. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Now, in terms of the church, uh, the Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another. Um, how did you come clean uh, and ensure that you remained on a path of repentance with other believers? The first thing that I did was that I contacted a, a organization where in my hometown where I lived that was dealing with their, their issue was primarily helping people come out of the homosexual lifestyle, but they also dealt with sexual sin. That was not my problem. Uh, mm -hmm. My problem was pornography, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a gentleman there that was, uh, that ran the program that was a counselor and I counseled with him twice a week uh, for a period of a year. And then once a week for a period of another six months. But that was a safe place. And that was um, pretty scary the first time I went. But uh, then you kind of get used to it. But the church that I went to started a program for a recovery pro, not a recovery pro, I guess maybe it was. And we would meet once a week. And there was a group of men, all of us struggled with pornography. We went through a program that we purchased from an organization. Um, and the first time you walk into a group and you say, you know, I struggle with pornography. I think I'm addicted to pornography. Mm -hmm. That's one of the scariest things you can do. 
because frankly, I'll tell you, in my case at least, the enemy did everything he could to keep me from joining that group, to keep me from getting counseling. You know, all the arguments that the enemy uses to tell you, you don't have to tell anybody about it. You can do this yourself. And it's all, of course, it's coming from the enemy and the enemy can't tell you the truth. If you hear something from the enemy, it's a lie. Mm. And uh, scary, mm -hmm. uh, very, very scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got your reputation, you're putting your reputation, you're putting your uh, place in society, your everything, you're putting it all on the line and saying, okay, guys, this is the truth. And um, it is, and it doesn't get any easier. <clears throat> when I retired, I moved to where I live now and I joined a church over here. And so at a men's group, the first time I attended or not, I guess it was the first time I attended the men's group shortly thereafter, uh, they asked me uh, to share because I was a new guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stood up and shared that uh, I had been a, a sexual addict to pro addict to pornography. Mm -hmm. You stand up in front of a bunch of guys, you're brand new, nobody knows you, you don't know them, and you share that. It's still scary. After mm -hmm. all these years, it's still scary. But yeah. you do it. Because that's what God requires. Yeah. Amen. How brave and how courageous that is to continue to do this over and over again. And I would bet that the more you're doing it, the more <laughs> the enemy comes at you. And so I can imagine, um, yeah, how scary that would be for you. So um, no, I got to add, though, that it is scary, but it is also very free. Mm -hmm. I had never experienced the freedom that I have experienced by going public with it, if you will. Yeah. By coming clean, by saying, okay, this is it. This is the truth. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live in the truth. I am not going to live in the lie anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the chance and come clean. Amen. And as you said, every time there's freedom that comes with that. And yes. I think um, we can all identify with that and on some level, telling the truth. Uh, yeah, that's, that's also in the word. It sets you free, right? So that's right. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. Amen. So in, in terms of uh, what's happening internally, you said that a lot of what you were dealing with was were lies from Satan. Um, did you try to justify? Uh, I know you said you compartmentalized, but mm. justifying is something I think we all do, whether it's a, a tiny sin or you know something gigantic. Can you talk to us a little bit about what was going on with you? Sure. Uh, you know, you justify it, or I justified it. I won't speak for anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I justified it by saying, nobody knows about it, uh, so it's not affecting my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not hurting anybody else because I am not acting out in relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife doesn't know about it, so it doesn't hurt her. Mm -hmm. So I can justify it. This is, you know, uh, this brings me pleasure because it does uh, bring you pleasure. A lot of sin brings you pleasure. Mm -hmm. But, and so I said, well, you know, it brings me pleasure. Nobody knows about it. I'm not hurting anybody else. And of course, those are all the lies of the enemy. But yeah. that's what justification is. Because mm -hmm. when you try and justify yourself, you're listening to the enemy. You're not listening to God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's so good which is why it's important to have other 
believers to hold you accountable to identify those lies because if we're in isolation how will we know if what we're telling ourselves is right or not so yeah well you become very comfortable in justifying yourself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know it's like the first time i looked at something sexual mm -hmm. uh, as a kid I was horrified at what I'd done. Mm. The second time, it wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. And after two weeks or so of doing this, a month, whatever it was, it's no big deal, not a problem. And that's a form of justifying what you're doing. You look back and say, you know, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but shoot, everybody does it. And it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, and again, it's the lie of the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. I, everybody's doing it. It's not that bad. Unless you stand before God. Yeah. God says it is that bad. Yeah. 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 One powerful thing you said regarding, um, forgiveness and privacy and versus public. Um, I love this. You said, since the act of forgiving my sin on the cross was a public spectacle, should my sin be private? How did you get there? That sounds like something straight from the Lord. How did you get that? Mm. that? It was straight from the Lord. You know, when I started writing this book, this devotional, it started during my recovery. Mm -hmm. And I would fall on my face every morning and I'd cry out to God. And I'd say, God, give me something from your word today that will help me through this day. Mm -hmm. And he was very faithful. He would give me one verse every day and then exactly one page in my devotional, uh, in my book, in my journaling, he gave me one page a day, every day, seven days a week for three years. And that was one of the things that he gave to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it, it was a, the words were from God, and it started with his scripture. And then he would show me what he wanted me to hear as a result of what he had told me that morning in mm. his word. Uh, and so, you know, and then eventually uh, I'd had all this written down for three years, and he says, now I want you to write a devotional. Wow. And, I said, okay, you know, and I got through writing the devotional, synthesized it, brought it all down, put it into 365 days. And then he says, I want you to publish it. And I said, God, you know, I'm a judge. I'm an elected official. Mm -hmm. I said, this is not going to go well, you know. <clears throat> and he says, I want you to write it. And I said, okay, God, but can, I'll use a pseudonym. I'll use a, a phony name. He says, no, I want your name on it. Oh, wow. And then he said, you look at God and you say, God, how can I do this? And he says, I want you to do this. And you finally end up saying, okay, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. You'll protect me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did all the way through so it was uh it was a god experience it really was and it was a lesson in obedience mm. yeah <clears throat> absolutely and the courage i can't say this enough the courage it takes you know uh, it's not about so much fear as it is facing the fear and oftentimes God will put us in these situations where we are terrified and yep. he, he, asks, 
us to obey him. Um, and it's, it's a lesson, you're right, in obedience and trust because it's bigger than us, right? This, That's right. These things we're walking through are not just for us, but for, for other believers. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Um, so if you're in a situation and you know someone that is struggling with pornography, it might not be you. It might be someone that you love. And it's, it's just awkward. You don't know what to say, but you're concerned and you love them. Do you have anything that you, you would advise our listeners that they could say uh, to someone that they love who might be struggling the same way that you were? I would start with something they should not say. Okay. Uh, the worst thing I think you could say to them is, I know what you're feeling or I know what you're going through, because you don't. Mm -hmm. Each of us is an individual. Each of us goes through it a different way, perhaps. But in general, unless you have been there, unless you have struggled with this particular sin, mm -hmm. you don't know what they're going through. What you do know is that you should understand at least that they are scared to death because they have just revealed to you a part of their life that they probably have not revealed to anyone else mm -hmm. or to very few people that they're ashamed of, uh, that they feel very guilty. Mm -hmm. They're terribly afraid that <clears throat> you're going to look at them, throw your hands up and walk away mm -hmm. and end the relationship what you need to speak to them about is you need to tell them that you still love them, mm -hmm. that you still have uh, their best interest, that you are not going to walk away from this situation. You're not going to walk away from them. Mm. Let them know that <clears throat> the fears that they have, that you're going to abandon them, are not going to happen unless that's how you feel and you are going to abandon them and then don't lie to them. And I think that in speaking to people, that's the one thing you need to do is you need to be very honest with them. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you know, try and put on the, all the things that people traditionally say that are band-aids because you've got a gaping wound and band-aid isn't going to help. Uh, just speak the truth, and as the Bible tells us, speak truth in love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can speak truth without speaking truth in love. Don't do that. Yeah. Speak truth in love. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I can see how <laughs> that would be harmful more harmful than it would be helpful in the moment of vulnerability that takes place. There's more need for love. And uh, that's how God talks to us, right? So exactly right. <clears throat> okay. Um, we're almost done here, but I, I want to say that um, the whole point of your book is to encourage those who might be struggling and have them um, face this in a way that keeps them accountable daily. I love that you've made this a devotional and not just, you know, an autobiography or a memoir. Uh, why, why did you, why, what do you hope for our reader, readers to come away with, right? Why did you really write this book? When, <clears throat> when you're involved in this sin, <clears throat> it's a very lonely sin because you don't talk to other people about it unless you're in a group. And then you only talk about it when you're in the group. Mm -hmm. um, you need on a daily basis to be encouraged, to be confronted, mm -hmm. to be uh, in God's, you need to be thinking about what you're doing and what God's doing and about staying straight for that one day. And mm. it, it is terribly important that 
people don't just say, okay, well, I'll go to uh, a meeting once a week and that'll handle it because it won't. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that <clears throat> you've got to understand and I, hopefully through the book, they will come to the realization that you're not big enough, you're not tough enough, you're not man enough to, to fight this thing. You can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. If God doesn't do it, if you don't give it to God completely and say, God, I can't handle this. Mm -hmm. I cannot stop. There's nothing I can do to overcome this sin. Only you can do it for me. Through your death on the cross, you have given me the confidence to come to you and ask, Lord, that you heal me. And unless you do that, if you try to do it on your own, maybe people can. I don't know. I know mm -hmm. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And this devotional is all about giving it to God and not trying to do it on your own. And standing with your brothers or sisters and confessing and being healed. Amen. So many takeaways today. And um, the thing I admire most about this book is how honest you are. And I hope that our leaders get that sense as well. I think in today's society, being honest and transparent about things we struggle with is so hard when you want to post on social media all the good things, you know, and I think that books like this are where we meet God and where we get honest and where we really, really grow. And so I thank you that you were so vulnerable today and I thank you for writing this book. And um, I just know that it's going to encourage someone out there, whether it's with pornography or sexual sin or any other sin, really. This is really about coming clean with yourself, with others, and ultimately with God. So I just want to say thank you, Judge Levis, for joining us today. Thank you for our listeners. If you want to learn more about what we do at Greater Impact, check out our next episode, and we think it'll help you out even further. Thanks for your time. Music